Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will introduce now um, Braden. So it's my great pressure to introduce uh, Dr. Braden Dulong, uh, who is uh, one of my colleagues in uh, Dalhousie University. He's a staff cardiovascular anesthesiologist in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Management and Perioperative Medicine at the QE2 Health Science uh, in Dalhousie University. He's assistant professor. Uh, Dr. Dulong graduated from Dalhousie Medical School. He completed residency training in anesthesiology at the University of Ottawa and went to pursue the fellowship at the Ottawa Heart Institute. He's certified perioperative echocardiographer uh, from the National Board of Echocardiography. Uh, Braiding uh, is uh, going to present uh, ascending aorta aneurysms and bicuspid aortic valve pathologies. Welcome, Braiding. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me here as part of this symposium. Uh, my name is Braden DeLong from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and uh, today I'll be talking about the aortic valve and extending aortic aneurysms. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. I was asked to review the international consensus statement on the nomenclature and classification of congenital bicuspid aortic valves and its aortopathy. I'll explain key findings that influence the surgical management of aortic valve pathology, and I'll use cases to demonstrate the role of echo imaging during the surgical management of the aortic valve complex and the ascending aorta. I'll start with a clinical question. Uh, here we have two bicuspid aortic valves, and the question is which patient is more likely to suffer from a catastrophic aortic event like an aortic dissection. This patient on the left with aortic stenosis and an ascending aortic aneurysm, or the patient on the right with aortic regurgitation and a root aneurysm. Now, most of what we know about the aortic valve is based on at least hundreds of years of observation and study, with Leonardo da Vinci being credited for the first accurate drawing of aortic valves with the associated flow vertices and Sir so James Paget being credited for noting the congenital nature of bicuspid aortic valves and their association with endocarditis and what he called morbid change. Now we've talked a lot about congenital heart disease and it's easy to come to the conclusion that these bicuspid aortic valves that we see all the time clinically are, are relatively minor, but in fact, due to the prevalence of one to 2% in the general population, they account for more morbidity and mortality than all other congenital defects combined. The natural progression of patients who have a normally functioning bicuspid aortic valve is actually a normal overall expected survival. However, to achieve this, uh, many patients require surgery. And as you can see on the right, about 30% require surgery, mostly on the aortic valve, with the remaining uh, primarily on the aorta. On closer inspection, we see that patients who have a normally functioning bicuspid aortic valve that have degeneration present have a 75% chance of requiring intervention or having a major complication within about 10 years whereas patients without degeneration precedent, present um, only had a 17% chance of major complication within 20 years. On the right, we see a, a unicuspid aortic valve uh, that shows all three type signs of degeneration. It is thickened, calcified, and restricted. Over the years, there's been many classification systems uh, to help try to prognosticate and help with communication about bicuspid aortic valves and plan for interventions. The most commonly used is SIVAs from 2007. With this system, the main category is determined by the number of RAFI, with type zero having no RAFI, type one having one RAFI, and type two having two RAFI, otherwise known as a unicuspid aortic valve. These types can be subcategorized for type zero into lateral lateral or anterior posterior. For type one, the subcategorization is based on where the raphi is. 
whereas for type 0, it's determined by where the cusps are. So for type 1, you can have left non-fusion, right non-fusion, or non-left fusion. A further subclassification involves if the patient has insufficiency, stenosis, both, or neither. Now, there's been some criticisms of this classification system in that it doesn't allow for uh, partially fused bicuspid aortic valve. It does include a unicuspid aortic valve, which some would say comes from a different etiology and has a different prognosis. And it's based on letters and numbers, not plain English language. In 2021, there's an international consensus statement on the nomenclature of bicuspid aortic valves, uh, which at the highest level broke bicuspid aortic valves into complex, typical, or uncomplicated. Complex bicuspid aortic valves were associated with genetic syndromes, other severe congenital heart lesions, had early degeneration and decreased life expectancy. Typical bicuspid aortic valves involved primarily primarily the aortic valve and the ascending or, or the aorta and degenerated over time, but were associated with a normal life expectancy with properly timed surgical intervention. And uncomplicated bicuspid aortic valves were silent throughout the patient's life and never reached clinical significance. The bicuspid aortic valves were divided into three types fused bicuspid aortic valves, which have three aortic sinuses, two commissures, and may or may not have a visible raphi. Two sinus bicuspid aortic valves, which have two sinuses, two commissures, and no raphi, and partially fused bicuspid aortic valves, where there's a mini raphi, which fuses less than 50% of the leaflet. Here we can see the most common type, the fused bicuspid aortic valve, uh, showing a raphi between the left and right cornea cusps and showing how the non-fused cusp is often larger with the left-right cusp fusion being the most common and associated with uh, root dilation and ascending aorta dilation and the right non-cusp being less common and more associated with ascending dilation. Bicuspid aortic valves occur over a spectrum, and as you can see progressing from left to right, they go from more symmetrical. And when we're talking about symmetry, we're talking about the angle formed by the commissures of the non-fused cusp, starting off close to 120 degrees at a very asymmetrical valve, up to 180 degrees which is a very symmetrical bicuspid aortic valve. And this has relevance for uh, attempted repairs, which asymmetrical valves are more challenging to repair than symmetrical valves. Now, there's certainly uh, aortopathy associated with bicuspid aortic valves. There's been uh, debate over the years whether it's more related to underlying genetics or more related to flow dynamics because of the valve. Uh, and certainly some of the newer technologies we've been hearing about today have put some interest back into uh, flow dynamics and stress on the wall of the aorta. However, it is clear uh, in either cause that there is an association. Uh, the ascending phenotype is involving the ascending aorta and is most common. The root phenotype is less common. And the extended phenotype involves either the previous phenotypes extending into another area or into the aortic arch. Now, getting back to the initial question that I posed, we're finding that patients with a root phenotype, particularly with aortic regurgitation, are at the highest risk of aortic dissection. And interestingly, if you look at patients who had isolated aortic valve replacements, even following the aortic valve replacement, uh, the aorta can continue to dilate, and it dilates more for patients who had aortic valve replacements for regurgitant lesions as compared to those who had repairs for stenotic lesions. In any case, uh, prolonged follow-up for patients who have a dilated aorta is indicated. So now we're going to put some of this information to knowledge and clinical cases to use in clinical cases in the OR. Our first case is a 54-year-old with a bicuspid aortic valve and an ascending aortic aneurysm. 
This patient had an annulus of 24 millimeters, a root of 35 millimeters, an STJ of 34 millimeters, and an ascending aorta of 50 millimeters. They had mild aortic regurgitation and no aortic stenosis. The American guidelines recommend as a class one indication intervention on an asymptomatic uh, root or ascending aorta that is more than 5.5 centimeters. At experience centers, this can be decreased to five centimeters. And if you're already opening the aorta for aortic valve surgery, this can be decreased to 4.5 centimeters at experience centers. Now there's a large range in the indication of the diameter that indicates uh, surgery is warranted. And with high-risk patients like those with Lloyd Dietz, uh, Lloyd Dietz uh, intervention is recommended down to as small as four centimeters. So it's highly recommended to have a clinic that's well-versed in aortopathy, monitoring these patients, screening family members where appropriate, and uh, giving guidance into when surgical intervention is indicated. Patients with high-risk features uh, listed here and of note for bicuspid aortic valve patients prior uh, coaptation or root phenotype puts patients at higher risk. The hard off the press uh, 2024 European guidelines uh, actually suggest a lower threshold for intervention in bicuspid aortic valve patients who have a root phenotype and they list some of the newer factors or uh, risk factors such as the length of the ascending aorta as described by Dr. Nira. So for our patient, uh, the free margin length measuring along the free margin of the non-coronary cusp and the fused left-right coronary cusp showed a discrepancy of about five millimeters. So this patient underwent central plication and ascending aorta replacement. Central plication is often used when the free margin length discrepancy is greater than five millimeters. It, create, it corrects leaflet prolapse reducing aortic regurgitation, and it restores the effective height, which is the height at which the pre margin of the leaflet co-ops above the plane of the annulus. So following repair, we can see that the cusps are now closer to 180 degrees. There is no aortic regurgitation, and the co-optation and effective height both suggest uh, a prolonged uh, duration of repair. Case number two is a 27-year-old with an ascending aortic aneurysm. So this patient presented to hospital with uh, chest pain and was found to have uh, ascending aorta more than eight centimeters. She had thin mobile cusps that were non-calcified and significant central aortic regurgitation. The annulus was 22 millimeters, root was 40, STJ 41, and ascending aorta 81 millimeters. Now the options for aortic valves are listed here. Given this patient had an isolated ascending aortic dilatation, uh, she had a class one indication for the European guidelines for uh, aortic valve sparing uh, repair. She's a young patient with normal cusps and has an experienced surgeon. A loss procedure would not be indicated here as her primary pathology is the ascending aorta, not the aortic valve, and there's limited time to arrange for this in a symptomatic patient. A surgical aortic valve certainly could be performed here and would allow for assessing and, uh, and um, repairing the aorta as well. A TAVI would not be indicated in that she has a non-calcified aortic valve, which is primarily regurgitant in nature, and it wouldn't allow for repair of the aorta. And balloon valvuloplasty certainly wouldn't be helpful for her regurgitation, it's more for pediatric and palliative patients. To understand why this patient had aortic regurgitation, we must consider the 3D nature of the aortic valve complex. The aortic valve complex has cusps suspended in the aortic root, and there is a virtual basal ring, which is the lowest point or the nadirs of the coronary cusps. There is the vertical auricular junction, which is where the muscular 
structure of the LV and the LVOT transitions into the intima of the aorta, and there's the STJ. In 2009, Dr. Bujwani published the Vopea Oriented Classification System for Aortic Regurgitation, the LQOE Classification System. There are three types of regurgitation described by this classification system. Type 1 being dilation of the annulus root or ascending with normal cusp motion and or cusp perforation. Type 2 being cusp prolapse and type 3 being cusp restriction. And as you can see by the various repair techniques recommended at this time in 2009, subcommercial annuloplasty fit was uh, fairly heavily uh, suggested as a primary or secondary repair technique. Since that time, we've found that subcommissural annuloplasty has had poor long-term outcomes, particularly where the annulus is, is dilated more than 25 or 27 millimeters. Alternative techniques have been developed, such as suture annuloplasty, uh, external ring stabilization, or reimplantation. There are also internal devices that can be implanted, uh, designed for tricuspid or bicuspid aortic valves. In 2018, Dr. Lansack uh, published his review of aortic insufficiency repair techniques. For patients with normal root and ascending aorta, he recommended uh, nothing or subcommissural annuloplasty for annuluses of less than 25 millimeters or if the annulus was more than 25 millimeters, stabilization at the aortic annulus and STJ with external rings. For patients with dilated roots, he suggested remodeling alone if the annulus was small, or reimplantation or remodeling plus annuloplasty if the root was, if the annulus was dilated. And for dilated ascending aortas, he recommended isolated ascending aortic annu uh, ascending aorta replacement for small annuluses or ascending aorta replacement and annuloplasty for dilated annuluses more than 25 millimeters. Dr. Schaefer published his algorithm for tricuspid valve repair in 2024. For patients that had calcified, thickened, or large, multiple large penetrations of their leaflets, they got replacements. If the cusp geometric height was less than 18 millimeters, they got valve replacements as well, with the geometric height being the height of the leaflet measured up to the free margin for each individual cusp. If they had a dilated sinus, they got valve preserving uh, root replacement. If they had a dilated annulus, they got annuloplasty. And if they had a dilated STJ, they had STJ reduction, with the remaining pathologies being repaired by cusp repair and a final check ensuring that the effective height was at least 0.45 times the geometric height and all cusp free margins were at the same level. So for this patient, this suggested we only required an ascending aorta replacement. Now, before going on pump to do this patient's uh, procedure, we carefully looked at the coronary arteries, which we should do always before and after uh, working around the aortic valve or aortic root. This patient did not have a cath being 27 years old and presenting acutely. And we noted something looked atypical about the left main. On closer inspection, indeed, there was no left main, and the patient had individual takeoffs of the circ and the LAD coming off of the aorta. And this became important because retrograde cardioplegia was difficult. The patient had significant aortic regurgitation and when osteocardioplegia was delivered, uh, the two osteo were not immediately apparent by surgical inspection, but were indeed found, which was very important uh, for cardiac protection for this patient. So this patient had an ascending aorta replacement. Following, there was trivial aortic regurgitation, and there was a good coaptation length and, co and effective height, uh, suggesting a durable repair. So indicators of a durable repair include an aortic valve annulus less than 25 millimeters, a coaptation height of more than or equal to 4 millimeters, an effective height of more than or equal to 9 millimeters, 
Ideally, no aortic regurgitation, but if there is regurgitation, it's better to be trace or at most mild, and it should be central, and there should be no aortic stenosis. 3D imaging is very important for these cases. It allows rotation to show surgeons a common perspective that they're used to or to match to other imaging modalities. It improves their aortic root measurements, and it is the only way to get individual coaptation heights, effective heights, and geometric heights. And it also allows for understanding of complex issues such as this massive uh, sinus of Valsava aneurysm shown. Here we can see uh, matching of the uh, root measurements to within one millimeter of the preoperative CT. A third case is a 62-year-old who had a bicuspid aortic valve and a prior coaptation repair. Here you can note they have significant aortic regurgitation and flow acceleration across their aortic valve. The annulus was 21 millimeters, the root was 34 millimeters, the SDJ was 29 millimeters, and the ascending aorta was 45 millimeters. With 3D imaging, we can see that the fused left-right coronary cusp is longer than, and the free margin is longer than the calcified restricted uh, non-coronary cusp, and it prolapses below this restricted non-coronary cusp, causing significant aortic regurgitation. The free margin lengths were significantly different. The angle was very minimally asymmetric, and the prolapse is again shown. This patient also had retracted leaflets with the geometric heights measured in diastole being uh, 15 and 10 millimeters, respectively. So this patient had multiple uh, issues that suggest they are unfavorable for aortic valve repair. They have aortic stenosis, they have calcified uh, leaflets, they have significant restriction and leaflet retraction. So this patient went on to have uh, supracoronary uh, ascending aorta replacement and uh, aortic valve replacement. And here we have an image of the persistent left-sided SVC that was diagnosed in the OR that again complicated uh, cardioplege delivery. And here you can see bubbles clearly entering through the coronary sinus before they come in through this superior vena cava. Our final case is a 53-year-old who came in with an aortic root aneurysm. Here we can see the sinus of Valsalva measurements uh, from cusp to cusp, uh, matching to the preoperative CT, sinus to sinus. And this patient on transthoracic echo was described as a tricuspid uh, aortic valve. of a perioperative TE suggested that there was a small mini raphi between the left and right coronary cusp, making this a congenital bicuspid aortic valve uh, form frustrate. And that was confirmed on operative inspection. The annulus was not uh, circular. It varied between 26 and 28 millimeters. The root was 51 millimeters. The STJ was 35 millimeters and the ascending aorta was 38 millimeters. The free margin lengths varied substantially between the cusp with the non, the free margin length of the non coronary cusp being significantly larger than the others. The valve was very asymmetric at 133 degrees and the geometric heights all measured uh, 18 millimeters. The patient underwent a David procedure and central plication of the long uh, non coronary cusp. Now, before we get into the results of this patient, I want to show some examples of things that you hope not to see with careful planning. So on the left, we see uh, billowing and prolapse of the fused coronary cusp, creating a significant aortic regurgitation jet, which is eccentric, and most would agree this uh, could not be tolerated and would require further intervention. On the right is a more controversial uh, case where there's uh, billowing between two and three millimeters, 
And there's trace aortic regurgitation. However, it is not central. And I suspect uh, there'd be quite a bit of controversy between if this would be accepted or not, depending on the patient's risk profile and the surgeon involved. For our patient, the effective heights measured for each individual cusp. So here we can see going through the middle of the right coronary cusp, all measured uh, well more than nine millimeters. And there was excellent coaptation lengths uh, here measured between the cusps for each individual pair of cusps all measuring well more than four millimeters, suggesting a durable repair. There was no aortic stenosis and no aortic regurgitation. And here is a picture of the interatrial septal occluder device that this patient had previously implanted for symptomatic PFO, Remember, reminding us all again to look for secondary defects in any of our congenital patients, and uh, which complicated dissection of the aortic root by pushing on the posterior aspect of the root where the surgeons were dissecting. Thank you so much for your time and the invitation to uh, present, and uh, look forward to further discussions. Thank you very much, Braden, for your excellent presentation. That was uh, really impressive, and uh, I enjoyed it and learned a lot, always from you.